Welcome to the studio art department at Bethany Lutheran College. Bethany is a special place for artists. Here we learn to witness in a visual culture and become good stewards of our God-given talents. Today I'd like to talk to you about Canvas and why, why it's used, um, how we can make our own, and some options that you have as an artist for uh, purchasing or uh, building your own. I'm going to teach you how to build your own canvas today. We'll cut the lumber to uh, custom size. We'll stretch the canvas and staple it and we'll prime it so that you'll have a professional quality canvas ready for your painting at the dimensions that you desire. So let's get started. Um, this is kind of a, a common size canvas and this is something that I I bought, and here are some, some aspects of the canvas for you to think about. Note that it has wood, a frame of wood on the back of it, and we call these stretchers or stretcher bars. And when you buy it, uh, you usually find, if you look in the corner, you find some joinery and there's some uh, kind of slots cut here. These are usually assembled uh, simply by the way the wood is cut and it fits together in an interlocking puzzle. There's a little spring to the canvas too and that's because the, the wood has a raised edge that's curved gently and uh, that way you don't feel the edge of the wood so much when you press down on the canvas. It stays suspended like a drum and you really only have contact at the outer edges. Historically, paintings would have been done either on, uh, directly on a wall or maybe on a panel of wood that's been prepared. So the invention of stretching canvas allowed the artist to, to make a painting that was large in their studio and then roll it up or simply carry it to the final installation place in a church or a castle or a mansion. And uh, that was a tremendous advantage because then the, the artist could work on a large scale without being on location. So really the, the advent of using a canvas was kind of a substitute for painting on a wall. You could paint in your studio and, and work large in a lightweight way that looked great when it was installed. So I've got some larger uh, canvases here <clears throat> behind me. This is a store-bought version and uh, there's a, what's called a spline here. That's how the canvas is actually attached to the wood. There's a, a piece of plastic that's wedged in here and this is a very precise process. You also see some braces, some extra uh, support. The larger a canvas is, the more it needs structural support. And here's, a, here's something that is a little bit more achievable from a do-it-yourself standpoint. So you've got a frame of lumber here and one cross member and then each corner has a little bit of extra uh, reinforcement with these triangles. You can see that the canvas has been pulled and stapled and that's the way that the canvas is applied and attached to the wood. So remember, larger canvases need a little bit of extra structure, something at this scale it doesn't need uh, all the extra cross bracing because the wood is strong enough at this length. And that's really a judgment call. Um, at some point you cross a threshold where you need to you need to strengthen this uh, stretcher system. The lumber that we have provided for us at Bethany is cut by one of our uh, carpenters on staff and uh, they generously provide us with this wood that notice has a bevel on it. And so there's a narrow end and a wide end and that's, that's a shortcut way for us to keep that canvas suspended. So if you imagine this as the outside perimeter of your frame, that canvas will, 
will staple and wrap around and then hover over the wood from that high point and will keep, uh, keep that canvas out of contact with the wood for the most part. It'll kind of stretch out from that high point. So we have that provided for you. I'll teach you how to cut that and assemble it. I do want to talk about the kind of canvas uh, options that are available to you. So really the two categories are primed and unprimed. This is an example of primed canvas. All that means is that it's been painted ahead of time. Often it's uh, double or triple coated and that gives it a, a protective finish so that your oil paint doesn't soak into the canvas. This is important because the oil paint will, um, it will gradually degrade the canvas. It'll actually sort of destroy itself as a painting. And also the paint will act differently. This becomes a relatively non-absorbent surface which allows the paint to slide across it so your brush strokes can stretch and extend. The underprimed canvas is uh, very absorbent. Um, it's really, it's just woven cotton, uh, similar to denim. Um, so it's kind of a heavy, heavy duty. And uh, the advantage of using unprimed canvas is first of all, it's a lot cheaper to acquire. And also when we prime it, it shrinks. And that allows us to get a really nice tight drum of our canvas. You have to work pretty hard to stretch this uh, pre-primed tightly. Um, so, you know, one way or the other, you're gonna do a little bit of extra labor. Okay, so I'm here at the chop saw. Uh, I'm ready to make my first cut. It's important that you, you don't measure too early. First of all, make a 45 degree bevel cut so that you can measure from that point. So um, you wanna make sure that you're beveling the proper way. You need to have this wider side always on the outside. And that means that will be the longer of your sides. We're cutting at, at a 45 degree angle and I'll just mark this in here. This is not a precise mark, but just for illustration purposes, this, this bevel can come here or here. Don't, you don't want to be out here. You want to have the high side of the lumber go all the way to the cut. Okay. Now, operating the saw, this adjustment needs to come up. So I've got this uh, shimmed up and I'll, I'll work on adjusting that later. But it's important that you hold this so that it's flush against the back so you don't want it tipped out like this. Push against the back. And it should, be, it should be flush against the bottom. So if I take this shim out, you see the problem. This lifts up a little bit. Here it's tight and here it's lifted. And we've got, we've got a gap there. So you don't, want to, you don't want to have to be worrying about too many things. Get it to kind of hold itself as much as possible, all right? So we're flush against the back, now I'm flush against the floor. And I've moved the saw to a 45 degree angle. So if you look in here, there's a gauge that has numbers. This is really a big protractor. So we wanna be right on the 45. And here's how we move it, there's there's a handle here with a trigger underneath. You can pull up on that trigger to unlock and then it swings. And there are different places where it will snap into place. See, it snaps into place. It snaps into place at certain spots. Um, so 45 is one of those. We're gonna snap into place there. There's also a lock here. If, if you wanna lock at some place that isn't a stop if you have a very precise uh, angle that you want you can tighten that in there for the most part we won't use that feature we'll just lock it in at 45. 
Okay? Now you do really have to pay attention to what angle you're cutting at and which, which side is which here. So I've got the high side against the fence and the flush uh, 90 degree side to that on the floor and the angled ramped side up to the ceiling. And then I can kind of use this yellow uh, opening as a gauge for about where I'm going to make my cut. And I can also pull down and just see where the blade hits the lumber. I'm going to hold that there and use my pencil to point. The, the saw will cut a channel. It will cut a certain width. And so that's called the kerf. Um, when you make a mark, realize that you want the blade to be on a certain side of the kerf. So, so I've made this mark here, and we'll make more precise marks in the future. Now that blade thickness might be about that much that it's going to remove. Okay, so you need to think if I cut on this side, that that's going to remove that much. I don't want that. I want to cut on the outside of my line. All right, so I'm going to line this up so that so that that blade hits the line just at that point. All right, and it's hard to see from this side. That blade is right on the outside of the line. Okay, you do need to pay attention to where your, where your cut is happening. Okay, now I want to hold this, and this can be scary, but I'm going to hold this piece of wood firmly, but from a safe distance. This is important, because if you're, if you're scared, you know, if you kind of don't, you don't want to hold it tightly, that's more dangerous. You need to hold this tightly and firmly, um, and just know where your fingers are, know where the blade is going to be. Very importantly, you never start the saw in contact with the wood. Okay, that'll cause a lot of problems. Uh, it'll be scary for you. So always start the saw in an up position. You start the saw by pulling the trigger up here on the handle. It's going to get loud. And then um, you pull down through your cut. So. I've got everything lined up. I'm holding on tightly. I'm going to make the cut. Okay, so that was a nice, nice cut. Take a look. I made all of that mark on there, and that was removed by the saw. And there's a little bit of my line remaining here, just a little shaving of the pencil line. So that's just a lesson in the saw kerf. We lost that much material in the cut. Okay, so it's not a laser. It's not, it's not doing like a tiny little cut. It's actually removing the thickness of the blade. All right, so I'm going to make another cut just like that. I don't have to, uh, don't have to explain everything so much. This is not a measured cut yet. I'm just trimming off the end, so I'll just move it. All the same considerations, and we'll get that going. Okay, so I've got two, two bevels now, and that lets me begin my measuring process. So back here at the table, uh, I'm going to now make a measurement which can be handled different ways. Uh, the next cut that we make determines the length of, of two of the sides of our canvas. So you can use a ruler. If you have a particular dimension in mind, maybe you've thought this through and you have a design that is supposed to be uh, 20 by 30 or something like that, or 12 by 16. Uh, maybe you want it to be a standard size. Maybe you want it to be a custom size. So we can, uh, 
we can make our cut in uh, an arbitrary way too. You can just make a mark and make your cut. That would be fine. Um, otherwise, you can use a ruler and just give yourself a mark. Now, here's, here's an important thing to realize. I'm measuring from the far side of this bevel. Okay, so I'm measuring from the outside to what will become the outside. And, and I'll just bring that up so I can see it at the saw. So I've got a little mark here that I'm going to take to the saw. And just, just for me, I'm going to put an X here, and that tells me which side I want to make the cut on. All right, so I'm going to cut an angle like this, and this is important, that we always have our angles moving in opposite directions. So skinny length, long length. Skinny length, long length. Let's go make that cut, and then, uh, and then we'll work on the next one. Okay, so I need to move the saw to 45 on the other side so that it kind of matches, matches my mark over there. Okay, and again, I'll bring this down and check. Remember, I made my X. So I want to be on the proper side of the line. And I'll look at it, make slight adjustments until it feels about right. Hold it firmly, know where the blade is, know where your fingers are, and start above the wood and cut through it. Okay, so we've made a cut, and this is looking good. We've got 45 degree angles here and here. They are beveling towards each other on the inside. Pointy sides are on the, uh, the wide side of the wood. Now, what we can do is come back to, come back to our other piece here, and we can take a shortcut. If we just line up the point to point like this, so I've got, I've got the, uh, the wide sides back to back here. I can just make that mark based on the other point. And I want it to be like a mirror image. Okay, and I'll make an X to remind me which side of the line to cut on. Take that to the saw and do it. These are now approximately the same length. Now take a look at this. Here's a way that you can kind of check if they're the same length. See, this one's a little bit longer. See that extra height there? So we can give it a little bit of a shave at the saw. If I bring the blade down and then press the wood up against the blade, put a little pressure on it, okay? And then I lift up. All right, there was a little pressure there. Now I hold that in place and pull through. That just shaves a sliver off, just, uh, just a little bit. Let's check. Okay, it came down a little bit. You can do that a few times. I don't know if you can see. I can give it a little bit of a push with the wood. And then release it, and that'll take a little bit more. All that good enough. There's a there's a little bit of a change there. I think over the length of the canvas, that'll be fine. Okay, so I'm going to start my next cut, my next piece, and you always have to be thinking, high side needs to be to the outside. So I'm I've got to make this bevel again.
Use one to measure the other. We're familiar with this. Line up. Check it. Okay, let me go again. Now, because I'm using the same piece for every, for every dimension, I'm going to end up with a square. Okay, if you want a long, skinny canvas, you need to be intentional, be more intentional about the dimensions that you're using. That looks real good. Okay, so uh, it's time to start assembling the stretcher bars, and we're going to use these 90 degree clamps. And they work pretty simply. They're, there's a 90 degree angle here and two different uh, clamps that screw in. Um, these are pretty cheap to buy. You should probably invest in at least one for your studio, and that would be, that would be a good thing for you to have because then you can um, fulfill this process, assuming you've got access to a saw. Okay, so to use them, get this lined up and make sure that your back, the back ends of these wood pieces are not falling. You need it to be level in place. And kind of get a uh, Get a dry fit first. So you hold these in place, and these clamps will work on a tabletop, or if you want to hang it over the edge, it'll be a little, a little faster, because then there's room to swing it. After you have these in place, loosen one and slide it back. So you can apply a little glue to that surface. This is wood glue, which we need gravity to do a little work with us here. Sometimes this happens, um, and you just have to adapt. So I'm going to make it work. I'll just apply a little glue to the surface here. Do my best to keep my work area clean. So I've got, always got a towel or a rag handy so I can wipe this off. Okay, so we're gonna get that glue to match and meet up and it should just slide right back into position so we can clamp it. Got some nails here that uh, if we take a look at their length, if I pound from the outside here, there's gonna be a little bit of grab. And we don't need a lot. That's just, uh, you know, we're being a little redundant here. We've got the glue, we're gonna have nails, and we'll also have the canvas to kind of hold the whole thing together. So this takes a little bit of balance. I'm gonna hold this, um, hold the nail and the panel while I've got it suspended here so that I can pound it in. This is a little high for me to be working. If you do this, uh, you might want to do it on the floor. It's a little easier to manage. I'm just doing this so the camera can see. Alright, now if you do two from each direction, that should hold it just fine. Note that um, you don't want your nails to hit each other, so, and you also don't want them to uh, sneak out the front. So you kind of position and aim them strategically.
Okay, so now we can take the clamps off. Looks like the lumber wasn't cut uh, completely precisely, so we've got a little bit of a change in the bevel here. But when a canvas is stretched, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So we repeat that same process on, on all four corners. I'll do that and then come back to you. Okay, so uh, we've got our stretcher bars attached and it's time to measure the canvas. We can treat that canvas measurement uh, again in two different ways. You can be very precise about it or you can kind of eyeball it. Either way, you do need to pay attention to what you're doing, okay? So here's what to think about. I didn't show this in the supplies, but you will need a good scissors or a knife to cut this canvas. And if you do use a knife, uh, be aware of the surface that you're cutting on. You can cut on these tables, but don't cut on your dining room table. Um, so here's what you need to think about. You need to leave enough room for the canvas to wrap around so we can staple it on all four sides. All right, so generally, you know, I've got about a fingers or a thumbs width here. It's kind of a rule of thumb. It all kind of depends on whether you're going to staple to the back or to the side. All right, so if, so if you staple to the back, you need a little bit more to wrap all the way around. It's a nice look though, and it takes a little bit more canvas, but it gives you the option of painting the edges and uh, having a clean looking canvas on the wall without a frame even. So I like that. I like uh, that I've got some choices later. How much extra canvas does it take? Barely any, you won't, you won't really notice. Okay, so, so I can eyeball this, or if, uh, if you'd rather, you can measure. So my frame is 22 inches, and around the perimeter, I could leave two and a half inches all the way around, do the math, and uh, measure the rectangle. In this case, it'd be a square. Um, I'm going to... Just kind of use my hand so I've got my knuckle here on the this crease is on the wood and then where that fingertip comes down you know I've already spaced the pre-cut edges and I'll just make myself some target marks here I'm using this is called a China marker it writes on just about anything a pencil or a piece of chalk would work just fine, or charcoal, I mean. All right, this is not terribly precise, but it doesn't need to be. It needs to be just precise enough to function well. So now I've got myself a dotted line that I can cut. And once you cut this, you know, that's a commitment, so make sure you Double check, you know, make sure that this is really the right measurement, it's the way you want it to be. This is nice canvas, um, and the studio will have some canvas available. You can buy canvas from an art supply store. The, uh, the Bethany Bookstore has a supply of raw canvas, unprimed. And uh, in a pinch, you can improvise. And here's how. You can go to a hardware store, go to the paint section, and find canvas drop cloth. That's just a, a package of a lighter, lighter weight canvas. It's got a lighter weave. It's not as nice to paint on, but it will act the same way. And it's way less expensive. So, life hack. Now, uh, this is unprimed canvas, and so it doesn't really matter which side is out. But if you were using 
if you were using primed canvas, you want this bright white side facing out. So you can kind of see a color change, color difference between the primed and the unprimed. The, uh, the unprimed is more of a natural color and the primed is a bright white. All right, so we always want the primed out, whether it's pre-primed or, or we're gonna do it after we stretch. Now, for stapling. You're gonna need a heavy duty staple gun, not a regular um, office stapler. And uh, the key to stapling is the pattern that you put the staples in and then applying a little pressure. So the pattern is center, opposite center, and then center, opposite center and then we'll move away from center gradually, always moving to the opposite side. The reason that's important is because you can certainly uh, stretch this wrong so that you've got big wrinkles in it. And we wanna try to avoid those wrinkles. So we're gonna apply pressure and then pull away from center every time and that will, that will pull those wrinkles to the corner and then, and then they'll disappear. Okay, so I've measured this so that I can get uh, all the way wrapped around. The first staple anchors the whole thing. You do need to apply some pressure here, so I'm gonna put my hand on the front and squeeze the trigger. It's kinda hard to do on these old staplers. There are nicer staplers, and if you ever need to reload, we've got plenty of staples. I recommend the quarter inch length. Okay, so we've got one here. Now we need to apply a little pressure. So I'm gonna pull tightly and hold that, get the stapler on, still applying pressure. So I'm pressing down so that my pull didn't slip. And you can see, maybe you can see, there's, there's a little pressure there and it's starting to create some wrinkles across, all right? So now I go to the other side and watch, I don't know if the light allows you to see that, but this is gonna start forming a diamond shape. So now I'm pulling from the center, holding that down, driving the staple and going to the opposite side. Pull, wrap it around, keep it tight, hold it down and staple. Okay, so um, it's slack in the corners, it's getting tighter in the center, and you'll start to see kind of a diamond stretch forming uh, when you're working. That's good. So now I'm gonna go back to the first side and pull away from uh, kind of in a diagonal. So I'm pulling in this direction, pulling away from center. Here's where it's nice to have a little extra canvas so you can grab something. All right, now I do the same thing. Remember, where's the center, you know, the first staple? I'm gonna mark those. So now I'm gonna pull away from that center staple. Now I've got three on this side and it's tempting to just keep going, but you gotta keep moving back and forth to get an even stretch on that canvas. All right, so pulling away from center. Now optional, this is a canvas stretching pliers. It's got two important features. If you're using pre-primed canvas, you need to use this. If you're using unprimed canvas, it's not as essential. Here are the two features. It has wide jaws, so it spreads out the force, and it has this lever on the back that helps you pull. If I come from this side, you can see this lever action. So you can clamp down on the canvas, and I've got it angled so that when I'm pulling, I'm pulling away from the center. Oh, and I just pulled that staple up. Let's get another one in there. 
So this is where it's nice to have a little extra canvas. We'll get that center one back down. So this side's got a little bit more and this is gonna work better. But you won't see it as well. That just gives me some leverage. Okay, now I've got three in each side. Now I can continue. So I'll go back to my first side. And, uh, you know, this is an optional tool. I'm just going to use, use my hands. Don't staple your finger. All right, now I can keep going a little bit. I'm going to go closer to the corners here. Now that I've kind of established each side with three staples, notice I'm still alternating. I'm going back and forth. I'm not going all the way to the corner because I need a little room. I need some room for making a nice origami fold there at the corner. Back and forth. Always pulling away from the center. And alternating. I'm leaving a couple inches between each staple. You don't need a complete line of staples. We're just holding the canvas in place. Okay, so this is, this is looking pretty uh, wrinkle-free. There's a little dust and crumbs on it, but it's looking all right. Now these corners, you need to uh, kind of pay attention. So the corners, we want to tuck in nicely. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can uh, simply gather it and turn it into a shark fin like this. And then fold it down and tuck everything away. And then put staples in. If you're up for uh, a little bit more uh, brain power or just uh, you just want it to look tighter, you can take that shark fin and turn it inside out so that all you see is one crease here. And you can kind of see where that's tucked inside and this all, this all turns into a nice neat corner. Okay, so with all of that gathered up, I'm going to put a, put a few more staples in to hold everything in place. Now this gets to be a lot of canvas. It gets to be kind of thick here, and the quarter-inch staples might not go through. Uh, they might not hold as well. So you could switch. Um, make sure that you apply pressure to make sure that you're getting those into the wood. All right, so let's do that again. And I'm, I'm taking all that canvas and kind of turning it inside out so that there's one seam showing. And then everything tucks in the back. Work my way towards the corner. I can try to keep it from uh, showing from the front so you've got a nice face. Pretty sure that 
that staple's just going into canvas right there. Okay, these back corners get kind of bunchy. So this is, uh, this is looking good. It is almost ready to use, but remember you don't want to do a painting on this yet. You need to prime the surface to seal it up um, and to make it act in a friendly way. So we're going to use gesso. Gesso is a, a word that um, has something to do with gypsum. Uh, historically, there's uh, historical formulas had plaster in them, gypsum. Uh, modern formulations don't really do that as much. Pro tip, I'm going to put a little water in this brush. I'm going to go over to the sink and get it wet before I dip it into the paint. That makes cleanup easier. Be right back. Okay, so I've got, I've got the bristles damp here and I kind of sprayed out the, the water so that it's not full of water. I'm just dipping the tip of the, uh, the bristles there. And there's a, there's a progression to think about with priming, just like there's with stapling. You take the, kind of the same pattern. You go center to center on the opposite sides just like we did with the stapling. And this applies to any scale, so this becomes important on a large scale when it's hard to, to keep up with the drying. All right, and then we're gonna kind of start filling in a diamond shape just like the canvas was stretching in a diamond shape. We'll move from the center out. If you think about uh, new jeans shrinking or, or cotton shirts shrinking in the wash, um, a similar thing is going to happen here. We're applying a water-based paint, which is it's getting these fibers wet. It's going to cause them to tighten up and shrink which is good, we want this to become a nice, tight drum so that it's got some spring to it and a little flex. It really is nice painting on a tight canvas. You'll feel it gives a little bit under the brush, kind of responds and springs back. That's especially true with a bristle brush. There's a nice springiness to a bristle brush too. Hog bristle, I mean, the white or off-white bristle brushes, the stiffer ones. Okay, so just like before, I'm leaving the corners for last. I kind of make my way to the corners, alternating sides. This isn't taking too terribly long, but imagine priming, you know, a larger canvas like this. And you can imagine that um, it takes longer. And that's, and that's important because that's why this pattern is important, because this is causing the shrinkage to happen in, uh, in a particular pattern, in a diamond pattern so that we avoid getting wrinkles here. And we are gonna work the edges as well. We want this gesso to lock into the fabric. So I'm kind of scrubbing it in a bit, trying to make sure that we've got a good Good adhesion here. And there, I made it all the way to the corner. You can, uh, you can 
get away with priming in one coat. And if you want to, uh, you can prime two or three coats. If you want a really smooth painting surface, lightly sand in between coats. And that'll knock down some of the canvas texture and you'll end up with, with a nice kind of springy drum head to paint on. Okay, now I can kind of even it all out. If I, if I twist the brush like this and travel this way, the bristles, think about it, more bristles are going in that line and uh, you get better results with um, pushing that paint down into the texture. And we can alternate directions to really get a good bond between the paint and the canvas. The weave of the canvas is going in these directions as well. Okay, so now we'll get the edges. I'm just gonna hold this from the back. You might want to set aside some time to do a bunch of priming, a bunch of stretching of canvases, uh, so that after that session, you've got a series of, of canvases ready for you. That's a really nice practice to just batch the work. See, I've got a piece of paper down here that's just to remind me to tell you to keep a good, clean workspace uh, as clean as you can. Remember, we're sharing this workspace, and it's always a good practice to be conscientious of your surroundings. You don't need to be sloppy. In fact, I want you to be careful. All right, this is a finished, stretched canvas that uh, needs to be allowed to dry. It's got one coat of gesso on. I can do a couple more coats if, uh, if I want to. Otherwise, this will be ready to paint once it's dry. I would say drying time, um, it might be ready in as soon as an hour. It depends on humidity. Um, you don't want oil paint to go over a surface that's still wet, that you know water and oil don't mix. So definitely, you know, overnight will definitely be ready. Just a note, uh, if you're using pre-primed canvas, you go through all the same steps, but you have to use this, this uh, canvas stretching pliers. Make sure that the primed surface is to the outside and stretch it as tight as you can with the pliers and get those staples in. And then if it still uh, sags a little bit, you can go to the back of the canvas. So I'll just illustrate with the one I just made. So pretend this is the pre-primed canvas and it's a little saggy. You can come to the back of the canvas and spray a little water on it. And that'll do the same kind of uh, shrinking, tightening action. If you uh, get a little moisture into the cotton fiber, that'll tighten it up after it dries. Okay, so that's how to prepare your canvases. I look forward to seeing what you make. Thank you.